Now you've scanned over 250,000 brains and have concluded that yes, men and women's brains are different and it can actually show up in subtle ways that can have massive impact. So what are the differences and how does that lead to a big impact on our relationship? So I actually published, I think it's the world's largest study on gender and on 46,000 scans looking at, well, what's the difference between male brains and female brains? And it's sort of like we're not the same species. The female brain, especially in the emotional circuits of the brain, are very busy, much more active. Their frontal lobe, so that's the front third of your brain, largest in humans than any other animal by far. Mm significantly more active in the female brain. Now, the prefrontal cortex is called the executive part of the brain. It's sort of like the boss at work, and it's involved with things like forethought, judgment, impulse control, organization, planning, empathy, learning from the mistakes you make, significantly more active in women. And the one statistic that shows that's absolutely true is who goes to jail? Males, 14 times more than females because they're not thinking ahead. You know, if I do this, this is gonna happen. If I say this, this is going to happen. Males and females both have their own significant strengths, but the strengths of the female brain is forethought, it's conscientiousness, it's collaboration. That is why they actually make really good leaders. But because of the busyness of their emotional brain, they also suffer with depression twice as much as males. And they, try, they attempt suicide three times more than men, but men are more successful at suicide three times more than women because they use more violent means. And often suicide attempts for women is a cry for help, but because men are generally not as good at communicating, they hold things in until it's too late. Oh my God. So there's so much there that I'd actually really love to dive into because I think that in as you were breaking it down, it's like, well, if we really are almost like two different species, no wonder sometimes we look at each other like the other person's nuts. So let's just even orient people on everything you're saying. It doesn't mean that women or men are better because when people say that they're not the same, it's funny how people get their back up of like, yes, we are. I just, no, no one's better or worse, but we're different. So now if we're different, how on earth do we use our differences to understand each other and actually collaborate better instead of, um, be at each other's throats and, you know, call each other crazy and nuts and things like that. Okay, so you say there's a lot of strengths with women and a lot of challenges with women's brains. And so let's just go through a few of those if you don't mind. So you said that um, women are more likely to worry more. Their emotional brain, especially in an area called the anterior, just means toward the front, cingulate gyrus, part of a, it's a part of a network in the brain called the default mode network female brains wildly more busy. So they think more, they process more, they worry more. And it's just because the gear shifter in the brain is very busy mm. compared to male brains. Now, we have to understand there are some males that have a very busy anterior cingulate and some females where it's sure. the, right? So these are in general terms, but when I look at a scan, I generally can tell how old the scan is, how old the person is, and whether or not it's male or female. Uh, females tend to have healthier brains. They have less addictions, left head injuries because they didn't play football and mm -hmm. so on, had fewer fights, so less head injuries. So mm -hmm. their brains tend to be healthier, but busier. And with the busyness, especially in that front part of the brain, they worry, they hold grudges. If things don't go their way, they get upset and could be argumentative and oppositional. 
in one study, they had 52% less serotonin. And what does serotonin do? It calms down that part of the brain, but it also calms down the limbic or emotional part of the brain. Most people don't know that. Serotonin is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which just means it calms things down. And if you have 52% less than I do, and I'm not worried about it, and you are, that's gonna cause friction. And because I'm not worried, now you're giving me anxiety and I don't really want it, and that can be trouble. Is it really 52%? Less. Whoa, 52% less than a a man. And so doing things to boost serotonin Mm. can help balance you. And when your hormones go low, serotonin goes low with it, which is why as women go into perimenopause or menopause, they can get depressed. Mm. And one thing most people don't know is that with progesterone, it actually goes lower 10 years before you go into menopause. So in your late 30s, progesterone, think of it as the brain's natural valium, when it goes low, now your busy brain becomes busier. You're more worried, you're more anxious, you're sadder, you're more irritable, you can't sleep because your brain won't shut off. And you go to the doctor who gives you a prescription for Ambien to sleep, very bad. For Xanax to calm your anxiety, very bad. And then for Prozac or Lexapro to help your mood, you'll leave with these three things that you may never stop. And I'm like, Check her progesterone. Give her a little bit of progesterone because then she might need not need any of it. And then make sure you get more sunshine. Increases serotonin. Exercise increases serotonin. Mm. And do something where you feel respect. Increases serotonin. Ooh, what do you mean by that? Well, whether it's volunteering or having a job where you feel respected or respect in your family, and women often, because of the worry, overdo for children, the child will go on board, and rather than go, I wonder how you're gonna fix that, they try to fix it. Mm. And the less you do things like that, the better, and your children will actually respect you more if you stop overdoing for them. And I Mm. teach all of my patients to kill the ants, the automatic negative thoughts that steal, their happiness, it's not a good thing. Wow, so okay, so you said the sun and exercise are two things that people can do to boost their serotonin and that will make them less emotional and so they'll be able to communicate with their partner better? Less worried. worried. So I don't wanna say less emotional because I want us to be emotional, I want us to feel our feelings Mm -hmm. because when we block them, they come out in pain in our body. And then sometimes the supplement, 5-HTP. 5-HTP is the amino acid precursor to serotonin, and I like it. I've used it a lot Mm. over the years with my patients. So anywhere from 500 milligrams to 200 milligrams. Perfect. Um, Okay, so I've got something else for you. I did a search on Google about what are the biggest complaints men have about women and women have about men. And I would love to actually read them to you and then you break down what is probably happening in our brains where we complain about the other person and don't get them. So number one for women, the biggest complaint they have is he's not there for me. What is happening in the brain where you may feel that intensely and the the guy doesn't necessarily understand that feeling? Well, you know, guys have ADD five times more than women do. So their attention span may be shorter. Um, Mm. But a challenge is once you get a thought, well, you may have that thought 50 times. So he might not have been there for you once because he was distracted, or you came in the fourth quarter of the Laker game and you wanted to like (laughs) test How much does he love me? Does he love me more than the Lakers? And it's like, wait till the end of the game, right? I mean, why are you gonna do that and then complain he's not there for you? So sometimes it's context dependent, but often when I'm talking to guys, it's like if you hurt her feelings, you really wanna be careful. 
because she may think about it way more than you think about it just because of the default network in her brain, which tends to go on repeat if she's stressed. And it changes during the woman's menstrual cycle. Mm. So I, I grew up with five sisters. Um, one week when I'm a teenager, one week they just really like me and they were so happy to have me as a brother. Two weeks later, I'm the worst thing in the world. And it's a very confusing, right? You always just sort of feel off center, especially if you have five females in the house, plus six with my mother. And so when I first started hearing about PMS, after I started scanning people, I'm like, I'm gonna scan women at different times of their menstrual cycle. And I was seeing this teenage girl and she was getting better and I'm at Marine World, which is sort of like SeaWorld in Northern California. Mm -hmm. And I get a call on the weekend, it's a Sunday from her mother, that she had attacked her husband with a knife. Oh, God. And I'm like, is this new behavior? <laughs> she said, right before my period, I've left him three times, but I got really out of control today. And I'm very worried. And I saw her in my office later that afternoon. The next day, the worst time of her cycle, scanned her. And then I scanned her again 11 days later. Mm -hmm. 11 days later, her brain was just normal. But during the worst time of her cycle, her cingulate flamed and her frontal lobes dropped, mm. which means she's worried, rigid, and flexible with no break. Oh. And so I helped balance her brain. She stopped attacking her husband. They're still doing fine. But your hormones, when they change, it can be frightening for people. And, and a lot of women know what I'm talking about. And some of them, uh, no problem at all, but some of them, it really puts a lot of stress on the relationship. Yeah, I mean, God, as you were saying that, I just thought if you've already got these differences between us, and now you add on to the top that our brains during our cycle are changing and um, there are stronger moments you know, than others. Th that understanding, I'm sure, becomes even more fit, uh, far apart. And you know, growing up, I just always heard a lot of guys going, oh, she's on her period, you know, stay clear, she's crazy. And as a woman, it was really upsetting to hear that, but it is very confusing because you're like, I don't, like all, everything that I'm feeling right now feels real, but I feel a little out of control. And so understanding what is happening um, and even understanding, I know that like the brain changes when a woman gets pregnant and doesn't like the brain shrink. And again, the woman thinks that she's going crazy. And if we don't understand it, then I think you feel lost, you feel empty, you feel alone. Um, and to add to all of that, then your partner looks at you like you're losing your, your marbles. Well, and it's very stressful for your partner because it's the unpredictability that leaves mm. him off center or her off center. And so just knowing and sort of, I have uh, a lot of my female patients just track their cycles. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's just know where you are. Cause if this happens two or three days before you start, we're not gonna treat that. Just know it and during that time, more things to boost serotonin, make sure you get out in the sun more, make sure you exercise mm. more. Sometimes a little 5-HTP can be really helpful. But if it starts two weeks before, then we really need to assess what's going on mm. in your hormones. And that's very important because sometimes balancing that can really help level it. Some people, it's called premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD. Um, it can be really bad where women get really dark. Um, they're just taking this natural sort of cycle vulnerability mm -hmm. and it's magnified. And it may be magnified because they had a concussion when they were four or five and they don't have healthy activity in their frontal lobes. And so when that time comes, your prefrontal cortex, think of it like the brake in your brain. It's like, well, the brake doesn't work and I have less control 
over myself, which is very frightening. So how do you stabilize the brakes then? You said serotonin, is that the key? Well, serotonin calms down the worry center. Right. So then we would need something like dopamine to increase your prefrontal cortex okay. activity. And the beautiful thing about exercise, it does both. It mm. does both. It increases serotonin and it increases dopamine. That's interesting. Is that why, so dopamine is like the excitement, right? That rush. Is that why we women go for like cake and stuff and like, um, like sweet foods when we're kind of during our cycle when we're about to have No, our that's serotonin. Uh -huh. They do the serotonin um, because, and do you know this is why restaurants give you bread when you sit down? Free bread, often amazing bread. Uh, what does bread do? It's a simple carbohydrate. Simple carbohydrates, bread, pasta, potatoes, rice, fruit juice, sugar, cause an insulin spike in your body, which drives serotonin into your brain. Mm. So tryptophan, uh, another one of the amino acid precursors to serotonin, it's a larger molecule and it doesn't compete well to get across the blood-brain barrier. Exercise takes the other amino acids, put them in your muscles, decreases the competition for tryptophan to sneak in your brain. Sugar pushes tryptophan into your brain, which is why you like it. It makes you feel good. The problem is it also makes you fat, depressed, and feeble-minded. So not a good thing. No, yeah. It's not a good trade-off. Yeah. Thank you for breaking that down, by the way. That was amazing. Um, the other thing that women have, uh, the, one of the biggest complaints women have about guys is they don't connect enough. There's not enough connection between them. So talk to me about that and the connection and why, again, I'm always just going to speak for myself. I, am, I definitely have a, um, uh, the connection with my husband. I feel it more than he does. So if we don't spend time together, I'm the one that has to wave the flag to be like, hey, we're not connecting. Um, now, we've just owned that with each other and said, look, this is my responsibility because he doesn't feel it, so I'm going to wave the flag first. And if I wave the flag, we've got an agreement that he'll pay attention, even though he feels connected to me. So what is happening between me and my husband or men and women with the connection part that potentially men don't need it as much as women? And typically they don't. Um, there is not one society on earth where men are primary caretakers for children, not one. And it's because female limbic brains or emotional brains are busy. And who do you attach to in your family? My dad was gone at work mm -hmm. all the time. I'm attached to my mom. And we're wired that way. And people hate when I say that. But there's not one, not one society on earth. Uh, I think men today are doing better than when I was growing up. But there's a great example of how hormones are involved in this. When I got together with Tana, with my wife, she was sort of like a guy. <laughs> I'm like, I had trouble getting her to commit. Mm. We'd be intimate and then she's like, okay, I gotta go. And I'm like, hey, where are you? <laughs> like there was no afterglow. It was like an after <laughs> zing, gone. And then we had her hormones checked and her ovaries checked. She actually had something called PCOS or mm. polycystic ovarian syndrome and her testosterone levels mm. were really high. And when we balanced them, she connected, she attached to me. And then our first fight was over the kind of dog we were going to get. So I want a little King Charles Cavalier. They're very cute. They're loving. They'll sit on your lap. You know, it's like my little buddy. Yeah. And she wanted a Mastiff. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and so we fought about this. And then once her hormones were balanced, she calls me up one day at work and she's looking at pocket poodles online. This little cute black, I'm like, who stole my wife? It's like, this is not you, <laughs> right? To go from a Mastiff to a pocket poodle change your hormones, change your dog. 
Wow. <laughs> I just hit the dog at the end. That's so incredible. So literally things like that then aren't necessarily just about taste. It's about uh, our brain and our hormones and our emotions. Absolutely. And women's brains get bathed in utero. So even before mm -hmm. you're born, mm -hmm. they get bathed with estrogen. Well, estrogen causes language to develop on both sides of your brain. So typically we think of language on the left side of the brain for right-handed people. But for women, it, they have greater, bigger language centers, which is why they often use more words. Um, and I tell mothers disciplining children, less words. Less words, use you're less more words. likely to get what you want. Because if you overwhelm them with language, they get confused mm. or irritated. Wow, that's so fascinating. Um, and I actually, you say that um, going back to the, the, the bonding, the, the connection between a mother and a child, um, that if the father is an alcoholic versus the mother that's an alcoholic, the kid actually has more trauma um, in their future if the mum's the alcoholic. Absolutely. And so uh, my first wife grew up in a pretty severely abusive alcoholic home. And when we got married, I mean, she's the reason I became a psychiatrist. Two months into our marriage, she tried to kill herself. And I took her to see a wonderful psychiatrist. And I came to realize if he helped her, it wouldn't just help her, that it would help me. And it would help our children and our grandchildren. And as the children of alcoholic stuff came out, I studied it. And if you and 30 million people in the United States grew up in alcoholic homes. Whoa, so 30 million. Huge. And they learned not to trust, not to talk, and not to feel because mm -hmm. it was dangerous. And, and when I saw the difference between if your dad was an alcoholic, it's bad. If your mom's an alcoholic, it's a disaster because she's the primary bonding figure. Mm. And if you can't trust her, it's hard to trust anybody. If you're not feeling strong and healthy on the inside, it's nearly impossible to show up and crush your goals and dreams. Take it from me. I ignored my health for so long and it had such a negative impact on my life, my confidence and my self-esteem. And that's why I want to tell you about Joy Women's Wellness. Joy Women's Wellness helps women like you and me take control of our well-being so we can feel like us again. Joy Women's Wellness will do a simple blood draw and then give you a super in-depth functional health report and together with your clinician you can come up with a game plan for how to balance your hormones get your energy back and start sleeping through the night so prioritize your health and just feel better from the inside out click the link below and run over to joy to get your levels checked right now and guys if you use my coupon code they're going to give you 10 percent discount so you can go and get started that's choosejoy.co now in my work, I talk a lot about trauma and how to heal trauma, and absolutely, it's possible. Tana grew up in a traumatic environment. Do you know the ACE questionnaire? Adverse childhood experiences. No, I don't think so, so zero to 10, how many bad things happened to you growing up? Four or more increases the risk of every bad thing. Well, Tana's an eight, Whoa. but our daughter's a one. So, and that's sort of the whole point mm -hmm. of our work eight to one is you don't have to give your trauma to the next generation. Wow, and it's ACE, you said, A-C-E? A-C-E, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Whoa. It's about physical, sexual, emotional abuse, neglect, witnessing a parent um, being hurt by the other parent, having a parent with an addiction, with a mental health problem, or going to jail. So it's how many of these mm. things happen to you? And I adopted my two nieces because they're both nines. And, but one of them's at UCLA, doing amazing. Mm. The other one's going into high school. Mm. Um, yeah, it's hard. I mean, development matters so much. But if you just understand these differences, mm. you just don't take it as personally. And one very practical thing, because men tend to be more distracted, you have to tell them more than once what you like. 
And so if you like like you're being intimate with each other, a, a lot of women will go, I told him, and he's not doing that because he doesn't love me. You only told him once. And it's like, how do boys learn to shoot free throws? They shoot thousands mm -hmm. of them. It's like, no, you have to remind them. No, don't be irritated about it. But in a loving way, it's like, no, do this. Remember, do this. And they love you and they'll want to, but they forget. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to remind them. So don't take that personally as if they're not into you. It is just how they are wired. Correct. And that you just have to teach them over and over a bit. <laughs> and, was... and don't be like mean about it. But what happens is I said it once. Now I've spun on it because of my very busy emotional brain. Now I've spun on it and now I torture. And I was like, no, nah, that's not a good way to do it. And I... and I used to think early on as a psychiatrist that, because I've seen lots of couples that it takes two to change. And I realized that's totally not true. It takes one person to change. Because if you begin to notice what you like more than what you don't like, the relationship begins to change in a positive mm. way. I was actually going to ask you, is that one of the things that for us to just remember? Because you, we act as if someone's going to respond the way we would. And so if I tell my husband, I really love this, I assume he's going to respond as if I would if he came to me and he told me he really loved it. Because if my husband came and told me, I really love this, I would plan, I would get him 10 of them. Like, let's say I got him a chocolate or something. <laughs> I'd get him 10 of them. I'd have him on reorder. I would put one on his pillow. Like, I would go, oh my God, he told me he like, cool. And I would remember that for the next 10 years. And I will have that in the back of my brain so that when he's going for a snack, I'll be like, oh, you want this chocolate? That's how I would show up. So when I tell him, I assume he should react the same. But when he doesn't, especially in my younger years, obviously now I just know so much about men and women and the brain and health and mindset and the difference between just humans in general that I don't do this. But I do remember back at the beginning, I was like, I can't believe he didn't. Like, is he not listening? Is he not paying attention to me? Am I not important? You know, and so you, to your point, that spiral of that voice in your head starts to make up a story. And then you poke at them because you're irritated, yeah. right? You leak, then oh. you leak, mm. which causes him to recoil. Oh, yeah. And then there becomes more and more distance, and then the relationship becomes vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So for people at home, don't judge your partner if they forget your anniversary. Like, what would you actually suggest? Because what I now do is I tell my husband, babe, it's our anniversary. I'll put, him in, I'll put it in the calendar. I then text him to remind him. I then will put an alarm in his phone to remind him to book dinner. But it's because I know this is what I'm looking for. Like, this is what I need and this is what I want. But I know that he's very forgetful and he gets very busy. So I try to counteract it. Um, but for anyone at home that's listening, how would you actually even then approach that type of discussion where, because it doesn't feel good if you just keep telling the person, remember this, remember this, remember this. Well, I think if they don't remember, it could be because they have ADD. It could be because they have a head injury. It could be because they're so focused on doing other things to take care of the family that that just hasn't bubbled up to the surface. I think what you're doing is perfect, right? This is a goal for you. He cooperates, he lets you put it in his calendar, <laughs> right? It's not that he's oppositional. It's just he gets distracted. And so you're just helping him with this. And if you really want a great relationship um, with that female busy brain, you tend to notice what you don't like more than what you like. You tend to notice what you don't like about yourself. There's one study where 93% of women don't like their bodies. Uh, and Did if you you're say not. 93%? 93%. Percent of women don't oh. like their bodies. And so if you're focused on noticing what you don't like, that's gonna cause chronic stress mm -hmm. in the relationship. I collect penguins. Um, I don't know if you notice them when they're in my office. I and did, yes. When my oldest actually was seven, he was hard for me. Oppositional, um, argumentative. And I'm talking to my supervisor, I'm a child psychiatry 
resident during that time. And she gave me some very great ideas, but then more time with him. And so I took him to a place called Sea Life Park in Hawaii, where they have sea animal shows. And I went to the whale show, and it was great, and the dolphin show, and the sea lion show. And all of it was great. But at the end of the day, we went to the penguin show. And the penguin's name was Fat Freddy. And Freddy did all these amazing things. He went on the stage, climbed a 20-foot high, high diving board, went to the end, bounced, jumped in the water. I'm like, whoa. Got out, pulled with his nose, counted with his flipper, jumped through a hoop of fire. And I have my arm around my son thinking, I'm a good dad. This is so much fun. And then the trainer asked him to go get something, asked Freddie to go get something. Freddie went and got it and brought it right back. And at that moment, time stood still for me because I asked this kid to get something for me and he wants to have a discussion. And then he doesn't want to do it. And I knew my son was smarter than the penguin. So I'm like, I'm the problem. So I went up to the trainer afterwards. I said, how did you get Freddie to do all these really cool things? She looks at my son and then she looks at me and says, unlike parents, whenever Freddie does anything like what I want him to do, I notice him. I give him a hug and I give him a fish. And the light went on in my head that when he did what I wanted him to do, I really wasn't paying attention. But when he didn't do what I wanted him to do. I gave him a lot of attention because I didn't want to raise bad children. Mm. So I collect penguins to notice what I like about the people in my life way more than what I don't like. And if you really want to connect with your partner, notice what you like. Mm. Appreciate what you like. You'll find you get a lot more of that back every day. You are shaping the behavior of the people around you um, by what you pay attention to. So because of your busy brain, if you just notice this is wrong, that's wrong, I don't like my body, I don't like this about you, it's just death to everything around you. And I, I love like little tiny habits, the smallest things you can do to make the biggest difference. Mm -hmm start every day with today is going to be a great day and and every day with what went well today i i notice when i'm irritated with tana rather than go i'm irritated about this i find something like i really like that about mm -hmm. you like we are fighting over a piece of property like i'm like in my head i'm like well why would you want to do that and but that would have been demeaning, right? I'm like, you're really good at thinking about and investing in property. And then I didn't criticize her. And she went, yeah, it's probably not a good decision. And so... Mm, it's interesting how the response will change depending on how you approach it. Absolutely. Right? It's, it's how you say it. Mm -hmm. Right? There are ways to say things that are demeaning and hurtful. And there are ways to say exact the same thing that are encouraging. Mm. And just like, how would I want someone to say that to me? And so start your day with what? What was it? I'm sorry. Today is going to, to be a great day. Today is going to be a great day. And then at the end of every day, I've even heard you say that on the day that your father passed away, you still did that practice. Yeah, because the brain's lazy. And this is a very important point. The brain is lazy. What you allow it to do it's gonna keep doing. Mm. And so I've done that practice for 13 years. And I go to bed, I say a prayer, and then I go, what went well today? And I start at the beginning of the day. And I sort of go hour by hour, looking at what I loved about the day. And the day my dad died was the worst day of my life. When I went in bed, I said a prayer. Kind of what went well? And I'm like, really, we're gonna do this today? And I did it. Wow. I, my mind immediately went to an interaction between my mom and the police officer that was just funny and tender and sweet. And then I went to sleep because I've trained my mind to help me rather than allow it to hurt me. Mm. Wow, that's so powerful. So powerful. And we live in a society where the people don't train you how to manage your mind, how to be mentally strong. Mm. Yeah. 
and that's what you're here for, <laughs> to help us all get mentally strong. Um, okay, I'd love to now talk about the biggest, com- the two biggest complaints men have about women, and this actually goes into with the what I was talking about, like the forgetting, right? Guys, you have to keep reminding them. But what's interesting is my husband never seems to forget anything that's sexual. So he forgets romance, or he may forget an anniversary, but anything sexual, we've been together for 23 years, he'll mention something of like our third or fourth date um, of something maybe sexual. And so one of the biggest complaints guys have about women is that there's not enough sex. So what is it then about men and their sex that that is so profound in their lives versus women? Testosterone. That we have not a little more. We have way more testosterone. And I have uh, a friend who's a woman who had way too high testosterone levels. So her doctor gave her testosterone, but actually gave her the wrong dose. And she actually wrote a book about this. And she's like, it was so hard being a guy because I couldn't stop thinking about sex. So if you have... 10 times or 20 times the level of testosterone, your brain is going for competition and sex, competition and sex. And this is why it's so important if your partner is taking testosterone, make sure they're checking their level regularly because if he takes too much, it's the prescription for divorce because his libido goes up and his empathy goes down. And that's a disaster. Um, Have you noticed that that correlates at all with infidelity? Yes. Really? And you can actually look at a man's fingers and you can look at a woman's fingers. It's called the 4D, 2D ratio. So the fourth finger, which is the ring finger, the index Mm -hmm. finger is the second one. If they're even, and yours are pretty even, means you got a lot of estrogen when you were in your mother's womb. If the fourth finger is longer, so my fourth finger is longer, it means you got testosterone. Well, the, the bigger the difference of the fourth digit to the second digit, fourth digit is longer. I did the big NFL study when uh, one of my NFL players, his fourth finger was like this, his second finger was like this. And he told me he had more than a thousand sexual partners. And I'm like, It's testosterone. So which finger? So this finger here, the one by your thumb? So fourth finger is one by your your Your, pinky. pinky, So if your pinky is the fifth finger, the fourth finger, if it's longer than your second finger, than your index finger, uh, you have more testosterone. If they're even, oh. then that means you have you know, more estrogen. Every woman is going on a date now looking at guys' hands and seeing their fingers. Right. You don't have to, to have them take off their take clothes any tests, at all yeah. to have a sense. <laughs> but, but bigger is not better because <laughs> they're more likely to have heart disease. They're more likely to be unfaithful. They're more mm. likely to get divorced. So good in fantasy may not be good is who makes the best dad. Yeah, oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, so actually speaking of infidelity, I'd love to talk about the difference and um, what it is about, and I assume it's testosterone, right, the sex drive. But I've also, you talk about in your book about how women are less impulsive, so you said that earlier. So I wonder how much of that contributes to men cheating on their spouse more than women because they're more impulsive. Is that part of it? Yes. And remember, men are diagnosed with ADD, attention deficit disorder, five times more than women. ADD is often a dopamine deficit disorder where women have a higher incidence of depression, so they have a serotonin deficit Mm. disorder. So one worry more, the other less focused, more distracted, excitement seeking. Now, plenty of women have ADD, but If you're excitement seeking and your frontal lobes are weaker, which means your break is not as strong, and you see a a cute girl, you're like, oh, I should sleep with her. As opposed to, I love my wife, I love my children, I don't want to lose half my net worth. I mean, like, 
practical mm. things that your brain should always be thinking ahead. A lot of people go, oh, I don't want to be anxious anymore. It's like eh, a bad goal. I want to get your anxiety to about 15 or 20%. I want you to have enough anxiety you think ahead uh, rather than no anxiety where you die early. Mm. So I actually have a quote of yours about, so being in a relationship and like, let's say you're questioning whether your spouse is uh, faithful or not. You said women are more aware of signs and their intuition, but women are also more emotional, which makes them prone to negative thoughts that end up lying to them. So I was wondering, like, as we're talking about this infidelity thing, how much complexity there is there where you've got the guy that is potentially more impulsive, has less breaks, is more risk um, you know, um, keen to, to take a risk. And then you've got women who the negative thoughts are going in their mind. They're, gut, they're trusting their gut. They're taking in the signals. But because their mind is looping and spiraling, that we're maybe reading into signs that don't exist. So as we start to think about people in relationships, what the, all, this, all this complexity, how do we start to separate, if you will, the um, as a woman, your intuition right? Like how do you actually start to listen to your intuition and how do you make sure that your emotions aren't lying to you? Well, and intuition is a right hemisphere phenomenon. Language is generally on the left hemisphere. So you may know something's wrong, but you can't verbalize it, mm -hmm. which I think mm -hmm. is really interesting. The corpus callosum, that's connection between the left and right hemisphere, you have this big track, is actually larger in women than it is in men. Mm. I often say, ask yourself for the evidence and write it down. So that connects, mm. I think something's wrong with the language part of your brain. And so if you can search for the evidence rather than um, you think something's wrong, but you really don't have evidence. And it just could be the right side of your brain is working too hard. And it may actually be from trauma in the past. Now, it may be real. Oh, yeah, right? of course. It yeah, may yeah. be real. But trauma from the past tends to get stored in the right side of the brain. And so you have more intuition that things are wrong when they may, in fact, not be mm. wrong. And if you harp on it, things are going to be wrong because you're creating more stress than needs to be there. Yeah, I, I really struggle with this whole, with infidelity and cheating. I've done more and more episodes on it. And I think the reason is, for me, I've been married for 21 years. It doesn't, any circumstance, any circumstance, I would be able to absolutely say no and walk away. And I would never cheat on my husband. I can say that with such confidence. I would never cheat on my husband. I would rather, if I feel there's a problem in my marriage, I'll talk to him about it. I would ask him a thousand questions. I would go to counseling. I would do therapy. But the one thing I would never do is cheat. I don't understand how someone can say, I didn't mean to, or it was, you know, it was just a one night thing. I didn't mean, like, I, I cannot get my head wrapped around that. And so as we're talking about the risk averse versus the people that are willing to take risks or the, um, you know, people who have impulse, what is happening where that impulse control can overtake everything that you just said, right? I love my wife. I love my kids. How on earth in that moment can the brain take over so that all the risk, everything, your entire family, everything you've built, maybe you spent 20 years with the family, that you are willing to risk that like that. Because you don't see the future. You just see the moment. And that's what your prefrontal cortex does, that front third of mm -hmm. your brain, it mm -hmm. sees the future. If it's weak, for whatever reason, say you have too much mercury in your body, it'll weaken your prefrontal mm. cortex, or you played soccer growing up and you headed a thousand soccer balls, you'll have a weaker prefrontal cortex, or you played football, or you smoked uh, a lot of pot, or drank a lot of alcohol, weakens your prefrontal mm. cortex. So when you're in the moment and you're attracted to someone, you just blank on the future. And it causes a great amount of emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And so for all of my couples, for me, what do you want in your relationship? I mean, know it, write it down, right? In your business, you had a business plan. 
a mission statement, a business plan. But most people in their life, they don't have a mission statement and they don't have a plan. And so I think to override weak frontal lobes, well, what do you want? And Tana and I want a kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship. And we always want that. But we get rude thoughts that show up. Or my libido's up and hers is down. Or hers is up and mine's down because of whatever else is going on in your life. But if we both have the same goal, then we filter all of our actions through that goal. So what would you do for people listening? Like how would you then strengthen your prefrontal cortex? Um, if you know, so let's say you're with somebody and you're like, yeah, they've played soccer and they've done that, you know, 10,000 headers. If you don't have the ability to get your brain scanned, is it safe then to assume that it is, um, it needs some help? Yes. And is there evidence in your life? Short attention span, distractibility, disorganization, procrastination, mm. impulse control problems. So that's signs of a vulnerable or weak prefrontal cortex. It's like, oh, I have to work on strengthening that because affairs often happen after alcohol. And it's why you know I'm not a huge fan of alcohol because the problems I see as a psychiatrist, probably half of them are related to alcohol in one form or another. Father drank too much, molested a child. Father drank too much and had an affair. Drank too much and this bad thing happened. Uh, it's like, don't take your frontal lobes offline. Mm -hmm. You always want, you know, if you want to have a great marriage, keep your frontal lobes working for you. And it's like, oh, but I just want to relax. But relax, right? Do diaphragmatic breathing, meditation, mm -hmm. hypnosis, just don't take your frontal lobes offline. So if you wanted to not only keep it online, but you wanted to boost it, what are the things you can do? So like for those people who played football or headed soccer balls, I'm a huge fan of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I did, published a study on it and soldiers involved in blast injury, significant improvement in the prefrontal cortex. What is it doing? It's increasing blood flow. So it actually increases a process called angiogenesis, help the brain make new blood vessels, increases stem cell production, decreases inflammation. But I love it because it makes the brain healthier, fatter, busier, mm. if you will, in a good way. Mm. Thank you for breaking that down. And I believe also you say that women are generally more empathetic, which means that we forgive more. So are we more like... Well, maybe. Oh. They also hold grudges oh. more. So. But is that tied to, <laughs> it's to empathy or that's tied to something else? No, they generally have more empathy and are better at collaboration, seeing things from another person's point of view. Mm. But if you hurt her feelings, she may talk to you about it 15 years from now. Mm because her hippocampus, so hippocampus is Greek for seahorse, it's the major memory structure in the brain. It gets things from short-term memory to long-term mm. memory. And when it gets damaged, people have Alzheimer's disease. But her hippocampus is busier, tends to be bigger, which means she's gonna remember if you had that affair. and. You really want to be thinking ahead. So she's not talking to you about it three decades from now. Mm, and that's because we have a bigger hippocampus than guys? Right. Why, why would we? What does that serve? Well, because you have to remember the berries that were poisonous. or mm. um, And your sense of smell is more intense. Female sense of smell is more intense. Females also have better peripheral vision. Guys have better tunnel vision. Now it's very oh. unfair because because your peripheral vision is better, you can see a cute guy and <laughs> not turn your head. But if I see a cute girl and I go like, totally You're get screwed. caught because she's got better peripheral vision. Yeah. Like, who are you looking at? Yeah. Although I'm fortunate, my wife will go, oh, don't you think she's cute? And not yeah. get offended yeah. by it. I heard you say in an interview, 
that when your daughter met a guy, the first thing you wanted to do is scan his brain to see if、um, you would give your blessing or not for them to get together. What are you looking for in the guy's brain to see whether he'll be a good partner for your daughter or not? It's absolutely true that it's it's not the first thing, but if I think you're gonna, <laughs> it's like you said, if I think you're、first. gonna stick, <laughs> so I usually wait for about four months, and if I think you're gonna stick, I invite you to the clinic. In fact, I actually don't consider you dating until I've seen your brain, and what I'm looking for is whether or not it's healthy. Because you know, people lie about doing drugs, and I'm like, I want to know: Is it healthy? Does it need to be balanced? And if it needs to be balanced, are you opening? Are you open to balancing it?、Mm. So I'm looking for how smart the person is, how healthy their brain is, and do they have the same value that I have, my kids have. Having a healthy brain,、mm. like when I met my wife、uh, almost twenty years ago, I really liked her. She's beautiful. She's smart. My heart would just go fast.、Mm. Still goes fast. So three weeks into our relationship, I'm like, "You haven't seen the clinic. Don't you want to come see the <laughs> clinic?" <laughs> and she's a neurosurgical ICU nurse,、mm. so she loved what I do, and we bonded over the brain. And We, I scanned her, and it passed. Well, so, so you were looking for those things. <laughs> I was looking for exactly those things. Is it healthy?、Um, is she going to drive me crazy? And what are you looking for with that one then? How busy her frontal lobes are. Because、mm. if they're overly busy,、mm. it's like she's going to whatever I do wrong, she's going to beat it to death, and that's stressful.、Mm. And wasn't it? Was it your son? Whose girlfriend you scanned and you were like, yeah, don't date. Please、her. don't marry her. I, I'm like, and I'm not that kind of father. No, you don't like, seem、I'm、like that at like, all. Yeah. You know, have a great life. Let me be helpful to you. And I'm like, something's wrong. Don't marry her. And he did, and it was a disaster. Really? I mean, ultimately, how happy you are, it's a brain function, right? The brain controls everything you do, how you think. How you feel, how you act, how you get along with other people—that's the organ of intelligence, character, and every decision、mm. you make. Those things are central to relationships, and most marital therapists never th- look at or really think about the brain.、Mm. But if it's not healthy, it's really hard to be happy. So I saw this couple who failed marital therapy. It's one of my favorite stories. They got an F. They went for three years, spent twenty five thousand dollars, and at the end of the three years, the therapist said, "Get divorced." Oh God! And so she failed them. She gave them an F, but they didn't want to be divorced, and they got mad at her. And she said, "Well, I know a doctor in Orange County who takes care of really difficult people. You should go see him." <laughs> and when I saw them, her brain was healthy, his was mothy. It was. Awful! One of the worst brains I'd ever seen, and in my mind, this drug abuse or alcoholism. But his history—I get a history on people before I see them—said never used drugs and didn't drink. But the first thing you learn about drug addicts is they lie. So in front of his wife, I'm like, "Is it true you don't drink and you've never used drugs?" He said, "I have a lot of problems. That's not it." And I looked to the wife and I said, "Is he telling me the truth?" She said, "Yeah, he doesn't drink. He's never done drugs. He's just an asshole." <laughs> But in my mind, I'm like, "Why does his brain look so bad?" And I'm like, "Where do you work?" He said, "I work in a furniture factory." I said, "What do you do?" He finishes furniture all day、mm. long. He was doing drugs. He was doing the worst drug of abuse for the brain, which is inhaling organic solvents, and so. I took him out of work, put him on a rehab program, and he was no longer an asshole. Wow! Did they stay together? Yeah. Oh my God, that's amazing. But how do you know、yeah. unless you look,、mm. right? All these couples that are struggling, no one's looking at the brain, and they just think he's got a character problem.、Mm. 
he's narcissistic or she's borderline or whatever it is. And it's like, maybe their brains just be tuned up a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a crazy story. So a guy's brain, I did a research and I'd love to hear your thoughts on if this is accurate or not and your thoughts on it. So I looked up, what does a man's brain look like in love? from a response standpoint. And I'd love for you to maybe even break down what is actually happening. Number one, their judgment is impaired. Absolutely. Las Vegas uses this principle, right? Mm. I mean, they have half-naked women giving you alcohol. Your judgment's impaired, which mm. means they're gonna make a lot more money. And when you fall in love, it's just like cocaine. Actually, Helen Fisher from Rutgers University has done a number of brain imaging studies, new love. So the basal ganglia, the part of the brain that responds to dopamine goes up and the frontal lobes go down. Wow, fascinating. Um, he'll form positive memories. Well, memory is formed with intense emotion positive or negative. So, which is why Tom is still talking about things from your third date. <laughs> <laughs> it was that good, Dr. Amen. <laughs> um, so you're saying, so in, the, so in this circumstance, if someone's in love, it's an intense emotion, so they're going to have better memories. Right. Okay. Like I remember everything about the first week of meeting Pana. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, it says that love de deactivates their fear of social judgment. Interesting. Your friends are going, no, no, no. And you're like, oh no, she's right for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is why don't get married after eight days. Mm. In fact, I say wait two years to just let the intense emotion sort of normalize in your brain mm. so you can see them for who they really are. Mm. I wrote a book called The Brain in Love, and there's actually a whole chapter on how to screen people on a date. Um, and it's like, use your head before you give your heart away. Oh. Because when you just fall in love, that dopamine rush, you don't see the dead animals around the oasis of love. It's like, should have seen this, should have seen that, should have seen this. What was the matter with me? And it's because dopamine overtook good judgment. I've got to ask you then, what do you do on the screening process? What does that look like? It's just a series of thoughtful questions. Uh, so if we went out, I would just want to know what it was like for you as a child. And I'd be really good at listening. And I'd want to know what your mom was like. I'd want to know what your dad was like. I wanted to know what kind of sports you play. And I want to know what excites you, what makes you happy. And I'm really paying attention. Are these things good for the brain or bad for mm. the brain? And it doesn't mean huh. if they had challenges, you throw them away. Like sure. I said, my wife grew up in a very chaotic home. Mm. Um, and my first gift to her was 10 sessions of EMDR, a specific <laughs> oh, wow. psychological treatment for trauma. She ended up going for two years. Wow. And it's one of the reasons why we don't fight, because we don't trigger each mm. other. I mean, we're respectful of each of our vulnerabilities, but uh, we don't trigger each other because she worked through hers and I worked through mine. Mm. Wow, that's amazing. I love those questions. I never thought about asking someone questions to figure out what's happened to their brain in order to understand them better within those dates. It's so genius. Because ultimately, you want somebody, somebody with a reasonably healthy brain if they're going to be the father of your child. Mm. I mean, my, my brain thinks ahead. Mm. Right, so like I'm nice to my children because I realize at some point they may be taking care of me. So <laughs> you better pay, pay your dues now. <laughs> so I'm thinking ahead. And I don't do too much for them because that'll create entitlement. Entitled people are never happy. But I, I think it's it's good. And teenagers often are not thinking ahead because the front part of their brain mm. is not fully developed mm. until. You're 25. And so one thing right away 
forgive your younger self because your brain wasn't fully developed until you're 25. So if you did really stupid things when you're 18 or 22, it's like, forgive the, your younger self, be kind. So it seems crazy then that drinking age is 18 in England and uh, 21 here, it really should be 25 once your it brain should is be fully 25. developed. And it's crazy to send kids away to school when they're 18. Oh. Like, um, their brain's not finished until they're 25. So mm. take their underdeveloped brain at 18 mm. and put them with a bunch of other underdeveloped brains and in a sorority or a fraternity, and you end up with all sorts of stupidity. Yeah. Now look, when you're 18, you think that you know everything. Of so. <laughs> um, okay, so another thing, it says that men's brains in love may feel less pain. Right because they have so many good chemicals going on. And their level of oxytocin, so it's not just dopamine and serotonin, oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone. In fact, I wanted to mention that. Um, so women, it goes up significantly with the romance, and men, it goes up significantly with orgasm. Mm. And so women need romance in order to have sex. Men need sex in order to feel connected. Okay, so a man's brain in love could help quit smoking. Well, he's getting pleasure from something else. Oh. Uh, smoking, it's so hard, which is like, don't start. Uh, vaping is not a healthy form of smoking, don't start. Uh, but it just steals the dopamine and changes the pleasure centers in the brain. It said they're more impulsive. Absolutely. As your pleasure centers go up, but your judgment thoughtful centers mm. go down, which is why new love, don't trust yourself. Be patient. I must say that once a week to my patients. Mm, do you like, really? Interesting. Be patient. So like, Watch. don't move in, don't do anything drastic, don't get a tattoo. Now, you know, I have a sister that got married to somebody after eight days and they're still married, mm. but uh, not recommended. Yeah. <laughs> um, they are extra kind, which I guess just makes sense because they're like feeling a little, like um, they're, they're more emotional. Well, it's the oxytocin and the, oxytocin. the dopamine that's going up. Uh, Unless you threaten their judgment, then they're not extra kind. Mm. It's like, do you really think this is a good idea? And it's like, you just don't understand. Huh, this is so fascinating. Um, one of the things that you say about women's brains is that women are less likely to be in the camp of don't worry, be happy. So there's this huge study out of Stanford where they looked at 1,548 10-year-old children, 1921. And then they followed them for 90 years. 90? 90. Wow. Looking at what goes with health, success, and longevity. And the don't worry, be happy people died the earliest from accidents and preventable illnesses. And why do women live on average seven years longer than men? They worry more. Men who are married live significantly longer than men who are not married. But women who are married do not live longer than women who are not married because they have to take care of men. And apparently we're stressful. Uh, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> apparently we're stressful. Um, you want some anxiety. So often men don't have enough and women have too much. Mm. And so I think you wanna get it to about 15 or 20% on a scale of zero to 100, right? More than 40, you're suffering, that's not good. But zero, you're making bad decisions. Mm. And there's so many bad decisions to make today that you know, more than ever before, whether it's addicted to your cell phone, thinking of alcohol as a health food, or marijuana as innocuous, or, you know, coming up here, how many fast food restaurants did I see? Brand new study out on ultra-processed foods, 
increase brain damage, increase 30 different illnesses, including diabetes, obesity, and cancer. So it's hard. You, more than ever, we need healthy frontal lobes uh, so to make good decisions. So you said there's roughly around seven years difference in lifespan, um, but I've also heard you say that actually the um, increase in our lifespan is actually for women slowing down a lot more than it is men. Why is that? I think it's the level of illness that's going on. 72% are overweight, 42% are obese. And you know, one thing we haven't talked about yet is women have a higher incidence of dementia. And it's like, why would that be? Yes, one is they live longer. That's the biggest risk for dementia. But when you go from having estrogen, having estrogen, having estrogen to not, that drop increases depression, increases memory problems, decreases blood flow to the brain. So I'm a big fan of hormone replacement. Mm -hmm. Do you know why your hormones drop with age, it's the planet's way of getting rid of you. Mm. And I don't know about you, but I'm not okay with that. Mm -hmm. And you, I don't want the testosterone level of a 20 year old. I do not need that egg <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but I'm fine if I have the testosterone of a 40 year old, mm. right? For enough to make me vital, uh, but not so much to make me irritating. So what's actually happening, and especially with women through, you know, perimenopause, um, because I've heard studies that say between 45 and 55 is when it's the highest uh, suicide rate for women. And that's when uh, many women, actually, the spike in divorce right. is initiated by women during that 10 year period. What is happening? What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank. One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. And did you know of who files for divorce? 75% of the time it's women. women yeah. That's crazy. And I think that's the right hemisphere seeing problems. Mm -hmm. That they're just much more likely to see it. And then with their hormone changes, they're much more likely to focus on what's wrong rather than what's right. There's another theory that I also think is really interesting. Before a woman gets pregnant, life's really about her. But once she gets pregnant, her brain remodels itself and it's now about family and protecting the family. But when she goes through menopause, it's no, the brain remodels itself again and it's now about her. Mm -hmm. And you'll frequently hear women say, this is my time. And that means she's been irritated, 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 irritated with him and now all of a sudden she's done mm -hmm. with him. And I'm like, balance your hormones and then see if you're still done with him. And maybe, maybe you are, but there's too much of an investment for at least not to see the contribution to hormones. So what if you haven't had children? I mean, I assume that it's your hormones still change. You can go through the perimenopause and things like that. But if you haven't had that shift, then you probably... I mean, it's an overgeneralization, but have been stronger about getting what you need through the whole time. And you wouldn't necessarily have that big jolt of a change again, because I know that, you know, people, especially a lot of women that I, I know, they have a really hard time when their kids leave the nest. Oh, huge. Tana was, when Chloe left and went away to college, which I was opposed to, she only left for a semester. Tana was gonna get depressed. I could see it. And I said, look, I'm gonna take off a week, a month, and we'll just go someplace, uh, just to try to protect her. Um, it's, they lose purpose. Almost like an athlete that 
ends their mm-hmm. career. And it's like, if they haven't figured out what they're gonna do next, they're very vulnerable to depression. And so my mom was really good in that she picked up, I'm one of seven, and after the third one, she picked up golf. And she just loved it, and that became her life. And she was happy for all of us to leave, I think, (laughs) because she had what was next. And I think that's really important. If you're gonna retire, know what you're gonna do next. So I understand the why women may leave their husbands around that time, but what about suicide? What is happening in that? Because of the depression. Oh, it's because the they see darkness and they see no way out. And I often tell my patients suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary feeling. Mm-hmm. And if you're sad and dark and drink, Alcohol takes the lid off of the break. And so I think more than half the people who kill themselves do it while they're drinking. So it's actually not uncommon to have suicidal thoughts, Uh, but it's uncommon to have suicidal behavior. And alcohol sort of takes the lid off of the break Mm. that prevented you uh, because people don't, see what it does to other people. Um, that suicide just devastates families. Yeah, I just recently been hearing about how women, I mean, as I get older, I'm 44, and so really paying attention to where my hormones are, where they're going to be in five years, where they're going to be in 10 years, and just knowing the facts. And that's why I'm so fascinated and so grateful for you to be sitting with me, just like answering these questions, because I, I want to know what's coming so that I can preempt it, so that I can do all the groundwork now and set myself up for success. And so me and Tom, we talk about, literally, we've spoken, I mean, it was like maybe even last week, where it's like, my hormones are changing, I'm 44, so how do we make sure we protect our relationship? And so understanding what is happening to me so that we can communicate as is happening is gonna be very key for us. So I've already went and got my, I was telling you off camera, I already went and got my hormone panels taken so that I know where I'm at, I am right now. And then also the thing that I'm talking to Tom about is how he can change in his communication with me as I go through this transition, because I'm going to assume that as my hormones change, are um, the things that he would say to me, the way he would say it, I may start to interpret them in a different way. And so we're trying to work on that communication. What else can I start to maybe think through or anyone listening that may be at that age um, in order to set ourselves up for a great relationship, feel good about ourselves and you know not have that depression that you're talking about and also protect ourselves from Alzheimer's because women are so much more likely to Well, and I think since you and I met, you have fallen in love more with your own brain, right? Treating it better and then not believing every stupid thing you think. So it's building these brain health and emotional health skills that will serve you no matter where your hormones are, but being smart enough to know, let me keep my hormones at a healthy level and let me make sure my brain's as healthy as it can be. Mm -hmm. And very few people think about it, but when I see the studies on estrogen, for example, and they look at 60-year-old brains with estrogen versus 60-year-old brains without estrogen, you see the problem, that Mm -hmm. without estrogen, your brain looks older than you are. And it's not good for you. So what would you suggest people can do then on like a daily habits um, in order, if they're around that time, like what can you do to actually boost your estrogen? Watch your products that you put on your body because parabens and phthalates are hormone disruptors. Mm. So that's a very bad thing. And we can't forget that women need testosterone, that a lot of the products that you put on your body steal your hormones are actually called hormone disruptors, parabens, phthalates, fragrance, and 
just scan all of your personal products. There's an app I like called Think Dirty. And it just lets you scan them. And are these healthy for me or are they not healthy? And ultimately it comes down to the mother question. Is this good for my brain or bad for it? Whatever I do, is this good for my brain or bad for it? And I have a mnemonic in all my books called Bright Minds. Keep your brain healthy or rescue it. You have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. And the N is neuro, brain, hormones. Get them tested every year. So the simple question, is this good for my brain or bad for it? But that means what you eat, what you think, what you watch, what you listen to, and what you put on your body. Just be thoughtful. Is this helping me or is it hurting me? Um, thank you for that. I think that those sorts of things and just being able to, in real time, change your behavior. And since I last saw you, I downloaded the app and now I scan everything to make sure um, with my moisturizer and things like that. Um, and then obviously I'm sure diet as well um, makes a huge difference, which I'm very uh, pay attention to. But um, is there any type of like w w uh, food item that is the most disruptive? Well, I think the most disruptive is sugar and foods that quickly turn to sugar. So there's this study uh, at the Mayo Clinic. People who have a fat-based diet, avocados, nuts and seeds, salmon, green leafy vegetables, healthy oils, have 42% less risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. People who have a simple carbohydrate-based diet, the standard American diet, bread, pasta, potatoes, rice, fruit juice, sugar, have a 400% increased risk of getting wow. Alzheimer's disease. It's the food. And we live in a society where the food is awful uh, for us. The, the, you know, think of Fruit Loops for kids in the morning or um, Frosted mm. Flakes or donuts, pastries, go to the office and they have crap. Uh, in the form of sh sugar and bad fat, and it's a disaster. We need to be really thoughtful if we love ourselves, right? I mean, ultimately, it's not what you should or shouldn't do, it's how much do you love yourself? Mm -hmm. And I love my six kids, but I never want to have to live with them, right? So like you're forward thinking, I'm forward thinking, how do I keep my brain and my independence for as long as possible? I love my brain. And I think the knowledge of it then allows you to make the change because I, my mum had a brain surgery last year and I was talking to you about it and getting your advice. And when I was there, so my mum's in her 70s. She has a brain aneurysm, so they, they're doing, uh, they're clamping her. And she just had the operation, so she's got her head all bandaged up. They had to cut her skull open, like they did the whole shebang. And they come in, they offer her pancakes for breakfast. And I know your work, we had just been speaking, you were also just on the show, and so I pulled the doctor aside. And I said, excuse me, can you explain to me why you're trying to give my mom sugar? And they're like, well, she needs to eat. I'm like, but not sugar. And they're like, well, actually. And so I just very politely stopped them, and I said, do you know who Dr. Amen is? If you don't, you should look him up. I was like, he's got the Amen Clinic in America, and I was just with him, and he taught me about what inflames the brain. And he told me that sugar inflames the brain. And they were like, oh, and I said, okay, let's just go to first principles. So I was trying to be very polite, but because you had taught me, I went in there with such strong conviction. And so I said, let's just talk first principles. Do you agree that sugar is an inf inflammatory? Yes or no? And they're like, yes. Okay, great. Do you think that my mum, who's in her 70s that just had a brain operation, should have an inflamed brain? Yes or no? No. So why are you offering my mum sugar? <laughs> and they didn't have an answer. And they afterwards, the woman came, one of the women came up to me. She whispered to me. She's like, I'm so glad you said it. She's like, it's a battle we've been facing for years. But like the hospital just insists. And so I just went and said, okay, from now on, I'm going to order my mum's food. Mum, do you agree? And she's all bandaged up. And she's like, yes, whatever you like. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to order my mum's food. And every single day I ordered her food for her. And she'll heal faster. Mm -hmm. it, it's insane. When you think of the food they feed children at school, what we give employees at work, what they feed to hospitalized patients, it's like 
did nobody go to medical school. <laughs> but in my whole medical school career, I got 16 hours of nutrition. Wow. Even though poor quality food creates probably 50% of the problems, you know, 75% of the healthcare dollars in America are spent on chronic, preventable illnesses. That should really irritate some people, is we can prevent it if we can get our food right. Yeah, and it comes to the knowledge, because if you're going to a hospital and they're like, yeah, yeah, have pancakes, why would you not trust them to be feeding you the right foods? And so that's why I'm just going to keep saying it. Like, your work is so profound and people need to listen to it. They need to look into your world because the brain is the thing that no one can see, right? It's like we all know... Um, like wrinkles in England and in Europe on cigarette packages they have to put photos legally of people to say like stop smoking and they would do these photos of like someone getting like a lung transplant and someone in the hospital with tubes out of them and then one time all of a sudden they put a woman's face with wrinkles on it the amount of women they're like I'm not touching those because they could see it and it becomes a, um, it's a vanity thing. Let's just admit it, let's just be honest. And so if there was a way that you could see your brain on the outside, um, I think a lot of people would probably love their brains more. Well, that's why I do imaging. That's how I fell in love with imaging. Because when I saw mine and it wasn't healthy, I'm like, oh no, we have to make this better, right? Motivation. But when my, parent, my patients see it, their guilt and shame about, whatever reason they came to see me, vanished. They're like, oh, this is a medical problem, not a moral problem. And oh, by the way, I can make it better. And it's really the sign of intelligent life. If you see your brain is troubled, well, let's make it better. And that's sort of the exciting news of my work. You're not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better. I can prove it. Mm. You said this earlier, and I didn't want to interrupt you, but you also said you can, like, don't trust your thoughts. Explain that to me. Thoughts come from all sorts of places. They come from our ancestors. They actually get transmitted in this process called epigenetics. Uh, they come from the voices of our moms and dad, from our friends, from our foes, from the music we listen to, to the news we watch. And they're creations of our brain. And they lie. Just because you have a thought has nothing to do with whether or not it's true, whether or not it's loving, whether or not it's helpful. But there's nowhere in school they teach us not to believe every stupid thing we think. And so in all of my books, I teach people about killing the ants, the automatic negative thoughts mm. that steal their happiness. It was about 30 years ago, I was in my office and it was a bad day, or a stressful day. I saw four suicidal patients. I saw two couples who hated each other, and two kids who'd run away from home. And I come home to an ant infestation in my house. And as I'm cleaning up all these ants, murdering all these ants. Like actually ants? Actually ants. Oh, 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 so, okay. An ant oh, infestation oh, 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 oh. in my home. I'm like, and you know, when you go to medical school, you have to learn 50,000 new terms the first year. And so we're always making, doing games with our brain and learning new things like mnemonics and acronyms. And I'm like, ants, ants, automatic negative thoughts. My patients are infested. And so I brought a can of ant spray and put it on my coffee table in my office the next day at work. And I'm like, I'm gonna teach you to kill the ants. And ant spray is not really all that helpful, so I got an ant puppet. And then I got an anteater puppet. And I'm like, we're gonna get rid of the ants. And one of my first patients I did this with was an eight-year-old boy that had a panic disorder. And I taught him to kill the ants. And three weeks later, I saw him back, and I said, how are the ants? He says, it's an ant ghost town in my head. Mm -hmm. So don't believe everything you think. Whenever you feel sad or mad or nervous or out of control, write it down. And then just ask yourself whether or not it's true. And then flip it to the opposite of the ant and meditate on the opposite of the thought. Mm. We train our brain every day to be positive or negative which is why I start every day with today is going to be a great day, mm -hmm. end every day with what went well. And when 
I get a thought that bothers me. I write it down. And I just don't believe what I think. Your brain is a sneaky organ. Mm -hmm. All of us have weird, crazy, stupid, sexual, violent thoughts that nobody should ever hear. And when you have a good prefrontal cortex, you don't say those things. <laughs> I say it to my patients all the time. Don't say everything you think. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's an interview where you were saying something like, it's like when you see someone walking down the street with a heavy box. Sometimes you think, maybe what would happen if I trip them? <laughs> but it's like, you don't actually trip them. But having the thought doesn't make you a cool person. Doesn't make you a criminal. But too often, because we had bad thoughts when we were young and we suppress them, people carry this chronic sense of being bad. Mm. And they never did any bad thing, but they had the idea, well, if I thought that, then I'm a bad person. And I'm like, everybody has crazy thoughts. Mm -hmm. Just don't act on them. Well, especially if you have a judgmental mind. And so now you have the thought and you're judging yourself for the thought. And now it's this spiral that you even said where we, women's brains are busy. And you can see how we actually go down and spiral and spiral. Right. And you get out of the spiral by writing it down. Mm -hmm. And if you do this process, so kill the ants, write down the thought, identify there's eight different nine different ant species, like fortune telling, mind reading, blame, guilt beating, labeling. So there's all sorts of, I talk about this in my work. So identify what kind of ant it is and talk back to it, right? I don't know if you were good at talking back to your parents when you were a teenager. Uh, not really, I was very obedient. I was excellent. <laughs> but I never learned to talk back to myself. Mm. Just because you have a thought has nothing to do with whether or not it's true. Mm. And I want you to treat yourself like a good parent would or a good coach would or a good friend. I've been, uh, I got to do some consulting work for the Miami Heat and Eric Spolster is one of the best coaches in the NBA. He notices what his players do right and teaches them when they can do better. And I also have this Olympic athlete, I, love so much, Alicia Newman. She uh, was the world indoor pole vaulting champion last year. And she's so special to me. And every tournament she wins or she learns. And every day, if you have that mindset, a win or I learn, then you stop attacking yourself. Attacking yourself's just abusive. It's not helpful. Mm. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Um, speaking to your clients, you have a lot of uh, notor notoriety around uh, some of the people that you've, uh, whose brains you've scanned, uh, being Miley Cyrus and Justin Bieber. What do you notice on child stars that have had that much uh, fame at such an early age? Well, I get goosebumps thinking about Miley right now. Her song, Flowers, uh, Song of the Year, mm. makes me cry. <laughs> Because flowers is about self-love. And when you grow up like those two did, I mean, it just depletes your dopamine. And it puts them under such chronic stress that both of them nearly lost their lives. And I'm so proud of them because they're doing so much better. But you know, Flowers is just such a great example of how you can turn your life around. And Miley's the CEO, that's the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. of her life. And she stopped doing things that hurt her brain and started doing things that help her brain. And, you know, she's a historic entertainer. And when you say um, depleted their dopamine, um, do you mind breaking that down? So fame is felt in the dopamine centers or the pleasure centers of your brain. Wow, people recognize me. But if you hit those centers... It's like that rush. You get that rush, and then all of a sudden, with that rush comes a lot of anxiety. People are watching me. Everything I do is scrutinizing me. And both of them had worldwide fame, mm. and both of them had worldwide shame. 
And so it's so unbalancing. But when your nucleus accumbens, so those pleasure centers get hit with dopamine, a little bit is awesome because it just makes you feel good. A lot over time wears them out. And then you need more and more excitement in order to feel anything at all. So many young stars then turn to drug abuse to try to feel normal. And it doesn't work, right? I mean, it makes you feel better in the short run and way worse in the long run. Mm. Now bringing it to, let's say, your everyday person, is that what's happening, let's say, with alcohol or drugs and why some people say, oh, marijuana leads to hard cocaine because some people have that, uh, that they're always seeking that more dopamine here and if they do too yes, much. Yes, but even more toxic is cell phones. It's every time you get a notification, it's like a little dopamine buzz, bzz, bzz, bzz. And then pretty soon, did you see the study where 54% of teenage girls report being persistently sad? 32% of teenage girls have thought of killing themselves. 24% have planned to kill themselves. And 13% have tried to kill themselves. Oh There's not one thing about this that's okay. And if you look at the toxic gadgets that are addictive, you look at the toxic products we put on their bodies, we talk the toxic food that they have access to. It's the prescription for this nightmare we're living in where last year there were 337 million prescriptions written for antidepressants. 25% of women are on antidepressants. This is not okay. And then, we haven't talked about birth control pills. If you're on a birth control pill, that just increases your risk of depression 40%. Ooh. So you already have a two and a half time increased risk of depression compared to males. Birth control pills raise that further. And then we have the dopamine depletion from social media, negative news, ultra processed foods. Uh, it's a shit show. Have you them projected forward? I mean, what are, are let's say, 20-year-olds who've had social media for, you know, 10 years, what's their brain going to look like at the age of 40 and 50? Well, I'm hoping that we can create a brain revolution. So that's my goal. Mm -hmm. The reason I think I'm on the planet is to end the concept of mental illness. I hate the term mm -hmm. mental illness. Call somebody mental, you shame them. Call mm -hmm. them a brain, you elevate them. Mm -hmm. So um, what if mental health was really brain health? So that's the reason I do what I do. We see this problem, and it's clearly a problem that's escalating. The way out is through brain health. The way out is loving your brain and taking care of mm. it by limiting your social media time, by eating healthy food, by not putting toxic products on your body and not believing every stupid thing you think. <sighs> All right, Dr. Daniel Amen, this has been amazing. You've got, I believe, over 40 books that you've written. Um, where can people find you and then your new book, Raising Mentally Strong Kids? Um, they can find it anywhere. Great books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. If you want to learn why women are more likely to suffer from brain diseases like Alzheimer's, then keep watching. I have a family history of Alzheimer's disease that really affects the women in my family. And mm -hmm. I always wanted to study the brain. So as soon as I was able to, I started asking questions. Like, is it just my family? Is it everybody? And back then, people would say to me, well, you know, after aging itself, being a woman is the most significant risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. However, it doesn't really matter because women live longer than men and Alzheimer's is a disease of old age so it's really just the women live longer. And, huh, okay. But then you look at the numbers and women don't live that much longer than men. 
<laughs> like in the United States, the difference is four years, not 20. In England, the difference is two and a half years. And Alzheimer's disease or dementia is the number one cause of death only for women and not for men. So there's something more clearly, yeah. right? And we started looking into that years ago. And long story short, we show that number one, not just us, but scientists show that Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of old age, but starts in midlife with negative changes to the brain that then eventually lead to the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, the memory loss, the confusion, all those kinds of issues. And midlife is any age from 35 to 65. <laughs> and so, so it's not midlife and some fuzzy 60 year old thing. It's like 35, 40 years old, you're middle aged, just for clients, which is frightening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then that changed the question. My question then was okay, if Alzheimer's disease starts in midlife, what is it that happens only to women and not to men in midlife that could potentially trigger Alzheimer's disease in a woman's brain? Yeah. And we show that the answer is menopause and losing your hormones, which really was very, very unexpected and changed the way that we work and that we think about prevention. So I think it's really about women's brains, not just Alzheimer's or menopause or this or that. It's more about getting a sense of the full picture. Yeah, and look, to me, I'm always, how do I get the full picture, the accurate information so that I can then adjust accordingly, right? It's it's like, what life do I want? And then how do I act in my current life in order to set me up for future successes? And so when I think about how cognitive aware I want to be for the, my entire life and then what are the things that I'm doing now in not just showing up now to have clarity of mind and you know to have a good memory but also for the long term you talk about the three p's so you've got puberty pregnancy and then pre-menopausal perimenopause perimenopause um so can you actually take us through so let's say you're going through puberty what is happening to the brain there and so that we can kind of break it down and then, yeah, then we'll talk about the pregnancy part. Yes. So during puberty, puberty is like an explosion of hormonal power, because this is really when your ovaries basically turn on and they start producing hormones that give you a menstrual cycle and those allow you to get pregnant. And that's been happening earlier and earlier on in life. At this point, some, some girls... Uh, go through puberty when they're 11, the average age is 12. And that is a huge change, not just for the body, but also inside the brain. And you would think that all these hormones would have a sort of boosting effect on the brain, right? But when you actually do brain scans and you look at the brain of adolescents, the brain is shrinking. As you get older, as you get older, your brain is shrinking, even though your body is growing at that stage. And a lot of connections between neurons are discarded with a process that is called pruning. Because what happens when you're born is that your brain just shoots out neurons the whole time. And all these neurons form connections with other neurons that are called synapses. But many of these connections at some point are no longer useful because your brain can go on autopilot. Right. By the time you're 12, you know how to ride a bike, mm -hmm. you know how to tie your shoes, you know how to make your own lunch. So all those connections can go and make room for new connections. So they're mostly related to social cognition and really becoming a, a member of society. So you need to grow brain regions. So some brain regions shrink because they're no longer needed, those neurons are, are not needed anymore. But other brain regions actually grow, like the memory center of the brain grows. The emotional center of the brain is called the amygdala, that also grows. The frontal cortex, which is in charge of judgment, planning and reasoning and controlling instincts and impulses, also grows a lot during adolescence. Is that growing a different way to then the XY brain, the male brain? Yes. So these connections are stronger in girls, in teenage girls. They develop earlier on in life relative to boys' brains. And that has been interpreted as girls reaching maturity 
intellectual mm. maturity a little bit earlier on than men, but also mostly about being more on top of things and like being better at judging the situation and also being able to manage risks a little bit more effectively. And at that point, your verbal abilities are also better as a girl, mm. language is more developed and a few other things. And again, these differences are subtle and there's no need to overemphasize them, but it is interesting to see that the trajectory of development it is a, are a little bit different between both. So does that have then a knock-on effect depending on them when you get as a female, when you get your period? So like if you got your period ah. later, would your brain develop l- later? Partially. So what happens with the menstrual cycle is that as the hormones change and fluctuate throughout the month, so does your brain and so do your brain connections. So when estrogen levels are highest, which is right before ovulation, that's literally when you can see, which is incredible, you can see the synapses firing up and dendrites growing. Dendrites, so neurons look like trees a little bit and the branches are called dendrites. You can see these branches literally growing and expanding right before ovulation and then withdraw when your estrogen goes down before menstruation. So even throughout the menstrual cycle, the brain changes on a weekly, if not daily basis. And granted, they're not huge changes, but they are significant enough for some women to feel the change, right? So many women are intuitively aware Mm -hmm. that their mood changes throughout the menstrual cycle, that their focus is different, their energy is different. And that's in part hormonal and in part is literally that your brain is changing along with your reproductive organs. And it's wonderful. And that is pretty much stable throughout a woman's reproductive life until you get pregnant. I think what, what we're missing in general is the fact that people are organisms because mm. Western medicine is always about specialties. You either understand the brain or you understand. Right. The brain. Yes. Right. You it, like I am a brain person and I never thought I would be talking about hormones or ovaries. And if I talk to my OBGYN colleagues, which I do daily at this point, they don't really know what to do with their brains. You know, they don't manage brain health. They don't manage brain. They don't know how to read the brain scan. But in reality, this is, a, this is a system that that works as a system and changes at the same time. And whatever happens to your ovaries has an impact in your brain. Lisa, this is why this discussion is so important and your book is so amazing. Um, so I've had a lot of health issues in my gut and I've been battling them for now probably over, over six years. And when it first started happening, I had gut issues, I couldn't eat, I hadn't had a period. Um, I was always tired, always brain fog. And every time I would go to a doctor, if I went to, you know, the the gut specialist, oh, I've got a tablet for that. But then over here, if I'd go to my, you know, gynecologist, it was something else. And I'm like, guys, there seems like there's a connection here, you know, and it's just like, but no one is like, they're like, oh, no one was talking to each other. And so I think it is so freaking important what you're saying, because I'm all about empowerment. How do I empower myself with knowledge so that I can approach any situation that I'm looking looking for with the knowledge and then I can adjust, right? So if it's, I want to feel extremely confident today, I know that my hormones have to do with it. And I know that by looking at the cycle or where I am in my cycle, I can determine whether this is a good time for me to step up and be confident, or actually it's a time to self-soothe and relax and take it more easy. And we don't talk enough about that because I know I've even heard you say, it's like a freaking superpower. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a superpower. I think if we were just educated and, and we had the information and the knowledge, we could really use it to our advantage. Because it's important, even just, just exactly what you were saying, what you said, like, no, how much coffee are you going to drink today? Does mm-hmm. it matter? Did, did you notice that there's, if you drink the same amount of coffee before ovulation and after ovulation, the effect is going to be completely different? 
<laughs> Do you mind if we dive deep in that? Because that's the sort of the stuff. So thank you for bringing that up. So you've spoken about, um, so it, when it comes to optimization, there's diet, there's supplements, exercise, stress, and sleep. So I'd love to go deep on into those. Um, and then we definitely will talk about the pregnancy because that is so important that I definitely want to make sure that we touch there. Um, but you, so let's talk about diet for, for starters. I, I love talking about diet in part because it's a very powerful tool that we have because everybody eats every day, right? So we're all, as a society, we, we're comfortable with the idea that we feed our bodies and that our diet will reflect into what kind of clothing we will you we will wear mm. or you know a certain body weight or body type. But the truth is that the same exact foods that change your body also really impact the functionality of the brain. So the way that we respond that the body responds to stimulants changes throughout the cycle. Okay. In that when your estradiol levels are high, which is the week before ovulation and the few days afterwards, then the stimulants will really have a good positive effect. So if your estrogen is high, you have a lot of energy, you don't need as much coffee and you feel the effects more strongly. Okay. But in the second part of the cycle, you'll need three times more coffee to achieve the same level of alertness. Whoa! Oh, three, I mean, times? three times is, is, is ballpark. I just mean... Still, you know, though, I mean, that's... Like, yeah, that. look, <laughs> it's still a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's still a lot. I mean, you, you'll need more. You'll need more caffeine to have the same kind of response. And yeah. that's why many women will drink too much coffee and then you get the jitters so you don't feel so good mm -hmm. or you actually feel tired because you have exceeded your threshold. So I think this is important to, to keep in mind. And something I like to do personally during the second half of the cycle is that I switch to cacao tea. I love coffee. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and, yeah, so let me So my espresso <laughs> is important to me. But sometimes if I feel like, tired and there's no reason for me to be tired then i'll be like oh maybe you know it's a specific kind moment of the month and maybe i want to switch to something more gentle actually just recently i was like why do i want the cacao so much and i think in part mm. is the is the fact that it gives you more energy for longer periods of time especially if you mix it mm. so caffeine and theobromine which is the antioxidant that's found in cacao powder. They're both vasodilating nutrients. Mm. So they improve blood flow to the brain. The difference is that the action, the half-life of caffeine is shorter. So the effect goes away a little bit faster and also it impacts heart rate. Whereas the theobromine in raw cacao has a gentler effect. It is more sustained over time, a little bit like tea. If you drink black tea, you don't get the rush of energy, but you'll be up at night if you drink right. it. Right, yeah, yeah. So kind of like that. And also if you mix it with something that contains a little bit of fat, like either milk, if you drink milk or oat milk or you know, whatever you like that contains a bit of fat, that will slow down the release of the caffeine or the theobromine to the brain, giving you oh. more energy over time. Yeah, which is one Whoa. of the reasons that the bulletproof coffee works so well. So for women, we need to be a little bit more careful or just a little bit more aware, especially those who, who do have sensitivity to stimulants. The same goes for alcohol. Mm, mm. That's fascinating. Um, are there any foods? So you mentioned like antioxidants. So is it a better time to eat like more blueberries in your cycle? I actually, I was, well... Yeah, I think you want to eat even more antioxidants and iron compound, you know, foods can contain iron and minerals is towards the end of your cycle as you prepare for menstruation. Well, yeah, but, you know, it's very depleting to, right. to have a menstrual cycle. So it's really important, I think, to replenish all the nutrients and, and be sure to support your body because there's also an inflammatory component, right? And so the antioxidants, the double down is anti-inflammatory, Nutrients are very helpful in that respect. See, there's so much more to food than just food. 
food is information mm-hmm. and food is function. And, and one of the functionalities of food is that very specific nutrients can literally speak to our cells. So for example, omega-3 fatty acids, and everybody's aware that omega-3 fatty acids are good for you. They're good for your body. They're good for your brain. They're good for your heart. And mostly have anti-inflammatory capacities. And one way that they do so is that they literally speak to your DNA in your cells and tell them, and they would be like, okay, I'm here. You don't have to produce that many anti-inflammatory compounds mm. because I'm in the circulation. Whereas if it's not present, then your DNA will know that it needs to make more anti-inflammatory enzymes to, to balance it out. So there's always a relationship between the foods that we eat and the way that their body needs to respond and either upgrade the production of certain things or downregulate it. I find it fascinating. And it's the same in the brain. Yeah, I find that fascinating too. And there's just something different though about the body. It speaks to you, you know, like, oh, my my shoulder aches, right? And you're like, what did I do? And you like think about what you did. And, you know, it's so very specific in the moment but like the brain even just like reading your book and understanding what we're doing now has like 30 year effect you know effects on you 30 years later like that really becomes um very enlightening and to make sure that i'm trying to eat the right things right now so you've said about the diet during the cycle you mentioned omega-3 um would you suggest an omega-6 is that right or just three yeah so usually we recommend a balance between omega-3s okay. and omega-6. Um, the point is that the Western diet, the typical Western diet contains a ton of omega-6 fatty acids and very mm-hmm. little of the omega-3s. So I think it's helpful to focus on foods that contain more omega-3s and trying to eat less of those that are very high in omega-6 compounds. Mm-hmm. You want a two to one ratio, whereas the typical Western diet is a 20 to one ratio in favor of the omega-6 or even higher than that because of all the oils and all the refined oils and Mm. all the peanuts and meat and whatnot so fish is a good source of omega-3 fatty acids fish Mm -hmm. shellfish um you don't have to necessarily eat fish a lot of people don't like it some people don't want to eat it because of environmental concerns and whatnot so there are plant-based sources of omega-3s that are really great I had switched from my beloved extra virgin olive oil to flax oil. So one tablespoon of flax oil contains almost all the omega-3s you need for the form of ALA. So you actually should have a little bit more for your brain because ALAs are the plant-based omega-3s, but they need to be converted into DHA and EPA and about 70% of the fat is lost in the conversion. So you actually have to eat more. So then you go for hemp seeds or um, flax seeds or chickpeas or legumes or something like that. Some nuts and seeds. And then back to the olive oil for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll do a bit of a blend. <laughs> um. So, okay, so that's fascinating. And so if you're unable to get it from natural foods, um, I assume supplements is the next best thing. Yes, I would say so. Uh, if you're concerned that your diet might be too low in these nutrients, then supplements are definitely recommended. What I would say is then supplements should not replace a healthy diet. Mm. And I find that sometimes people would much rather get the supplements than eat healthily. And that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Mm-hmm. So it's best to really focus on having a healthy diet and a diverse diet with all sorts of foods and nutrients and supplements as a backup. I would say that would be my backup plan. Lots of patients will come to us and say, give me something, you know, whether it's a supplement mm-hmm. or something. And so we're like, well, let, let's do some tests first and see if your levels are actually low because otherwise supplements don't work. They only work if they're supplementing, which means that you have to be low in the nutrients first in order for the supplement to have a benefit for you. So I think it's important to know yourself, know your numbers. I think in medicine, we're switching to a precision medicine approach where instead of treating the average person or to treat a person as a 
point in a regression line, you know, we actually want to understand the person in front of us and, and do all the tests that we can do and understand your physiology and then interact with your physiology in a way that it is helpful to you. I think that's so that important. <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing, especially. So I've been married to my husband now for almost 20 years. And, you know, when he's when he's taking you know, vitamin D and he's taking all these supplements and, it, you know, originally I was just copying whatever he was doing. So everything that you're talking about is being very um, catered to you, I think is so spot on. Um, so I love that. Um, but now let's talk about exercise because I heard you say, and it's so true where you have, let's say like the woman wants to like lose weight. Right. And so she's like changes her diet and she goes on like these sprints and does all these exercises and like loses half a pound. And then you've got the guy that just quits soda and doesn't change his exercise routine at all. And then ends up losing 20 pounds. So that obviously can be very frustrating, but I think it's actually important to discuss what is happening to a female, um, what exercises can we do that is good for our brains. Um, so yeah, if you can take us down now, that would be great. Mm -hmm. I think that is really important. Exercise is the same as diet. There is no one size that fits all and it's very personal. And it depends, it depends on what your goals are. If we're thinking about the brain, yeah. Then what's really important is not intensity as much as consistency. This is what the research on exercise and brain health shows. Then the key is really, obviously, if you, if you can go higher intensity and it's enjoyable to you and you can do it, good, absolutely. Nobody's going to stop you, believe me. But the problem, especially in the United States, is that people don't exercise that much to start with. And especially for women, there's a very sharp decline in the amount of time that is devoted to exercise or even just moving, just being physically active as soon as we're past college, right? Because of whatever reasons in societies and demands and growing a family and just holding a job and whatnot, women just don't make as much time for exercise as they do for other things. What is important is to make exercise a routine part of your wellness plan, right? So to speak, and it's very hard to do that. It's honestly very hard, but what the brain wants at the minimum, it's a moderate intensity exercise. And the need for frequency ranges between three and five times a week. And most experts recommend at least 45 minutes a moderate intensity exercise three to five times a week. If you can do five, it's better than three. If you can do three, it's better than none. Yeah. So I think it's also important to be gentle with yourself and really understand whether or not a specific routine fits into your everyday life and make it sustainable. Women who are physically active after the age of 35 have a 30% lower risk of dementia in old age than women who are sedentary. And 30% is insane. 30%, one in three. Ooh. One in three. So that is very important. If we had drugs that lowered your risk of dementia in old age by 30%, it would be FDA approved tomorrow and everybody would take it, right? Instead... We don't have it, <laughs> we don't have that drug, but we can exercise. So we always recommend this to our patient, just find the exercise routine that works for you, that you like, you need to have your, you need to get your heart beating faster. That, that is key. You know, yes, mm -hmm. walking is lovely, but then walk faster. You have to challenge your cardiovascular system so that the brain can experience an increase in blood flow, more oxygen, more nutrients, more resilience, because the brain contains a huge amount of veins. Basically, you know, the, the vasculature of the brain is incredible. You need to support it. And, and you do it by keeping your heart strong in your entire system strong. So brisk walk five times a week, three times a week, great. If you can do something more, a clinical trials of exercise has shown that some parts of your brain can actually regrow oh my god yeah like the memory center of the brain the hippocampus actually 
did not show any decline mm -hmm. if people were walking fast. These were elderly people who were just walking fast very often, like throughout the week. And actually, in some cases, show show a bit of a, a rebound. I mean, that's so beautiful, like valuable information. So I am always looking at how do I show up tomorrow morning, right? How do I shop today in the best way that I possibly can? Um, if I have to look at my hormones and amazing, if I have to look at like, what are the things that I need to look at in order to protect my brain so that I can show up, being able to make business decisions, being able to be um, emotionally like sober, I like to call it so that I can have um, maybe some conflicts in the day that it doesn't spill me over emotionally. Like how do I show up to be strong and confident? Like everything we're talking about. Um, is about the now, but then also what are the things that I can do for to help my the future Lisa in me that's going to get there, right? Like the hope is that I do live long enough to be 95 years old. So what are, the, you know, what are the things? So exercise is fantastic, diet, supplement, Let's talk about stress. Stress is, we all know that, you know, especially now these days, stress isn't good for you. It gets, you know, it's actually causing you know early heart attacks and strokes and things like that but i've actually heard you say that stress is actually harder on females than it is on males can you talk to me about that because that was fascinating yes yeah, so, uh, what happens in reality is that stress works in balance with our sex hormones so the way that the body reacts to stress is by increasing the production of a hormone called cortisol, which is the main stress hormone. And the way that the brain is, the body and the brain is able to do that is by sinking or reducing the production of your sex hormones because they, they all come from the same precursor. For your brain and your body to be able to increase the production of cortisol, that means suppressing the production of sex hormones like estradiol and progesterone. Mm. When that happens, as a woman, you don't feel great because your brain is literally wired to be activated in part by the estrogen, especially the estrogen, but also the progesterone, because estrogen is an activator for the brain. It's a neuroprotective hormone that has a very boosting effect on brain energy levels. So when your cortisol goes up, your estradiol goes down and your brain suffers. And then new studies with brain scans that, that use brain scans to look at this relationship has shown that chronic stress, so not just acute, occasional mm -hmm. stress, but chronic stress, increases cortisol levels in a way this is quite persistent and that really has deleterious effect on memory performance already in midlife so starting at age 35 especially in women and that gets worse after women go through menopause because then the high cortisol actually correlates with brain shrinkage only in women Wow. Yes, that is bad news. That is very bad news because that I don't is. know any woman who's not under stress, most mm -hmm. likely chronic stress. Like you turn 35 and you're stressed out, and that is unlikely to get better <laughs> unless you really put an effort and come up with strategies to reduce stress. So Reducing stress doesn't just save your day. It also really saves your brain for the long term. So I think it's really important for all of us to just take a collective <gasps> sigh, you know, and just acknowledge the fact that we're all under stress and that we need to, we really need to prioritize reducing stress is a very important brain protective strategy. And we, I think we're all aware that well-being is a skill. Right? We, we know that cultivating well-being is really a skill and is, a, is mm -hmm. very much an urgent public health need, but we're not given the tools to do that. Yeah. Like we, we have a, a million different tools to take care of our hair, to take care of our skin. <laughs> so true. Right? For our bodies to look a certain way, you go to the gym, there are all, there's all sorts of contraptions available. But very little has been done for people to really have the tools to cultivate mental health and well-being. And we live in a, in a society that consistently prioritizes productivity and just soldering on and, and, and just toughening up instead of de-stressing and taking time for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think especially as women, we need to do that because a woman has no time for herself. And men could say, well, we don't have either. Yeah, but, but women 
have less, right? And we just starts as soon as you leave school and you find the job that you're literally sandwiched between responsibilities and there's mm-hmm. so many expectations and you have to work so hard just to keep your role in society and just to keep your job. You have to fight for equal rights and equal pay and you're under stress. So we need to find solutions against stress. I, I really strongly yeah. believe that. I'm not good at it, by the way. <laughs> so that's the thing. Okay, so let's say everything you're saying, right? Completely agree with. You agree with too. But we both know we're not great at it. So what are the things, because everyone listening, I'm sure is thinking the same, right? It's like, oh my God, I get it. Yes, it's really detrimental. Way worse than I think we ever thought it was. Um, and so now it's like, but how do we actually monitor that and live a life right where we live a life where we can get on with our lives that we're not you know like for instance running a business and doing a show like women of impact it's freaking stressful but i love it right but it's 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 filling my heart it's my mission it's my purpose so i go i'm not going to stop it but i recognize that stress is very detrimental to my health and how i show up and how i'm going to be at 90 years old so what are the things that we can do just to keep an eye on that doesn't become an entire life change? Because I wish it could be everyone could do life changes. We all magically change the way that we live and we're all good. And now we're managing our stress. We all know that's not a reality. So what are the things in reality, knowing all the things you have to go through, knowing all the things I have to go through that we can do maybe on a day to day basis that can help alleviate that so that we don't blink and in five, 10 years, we're a big ball of stress and we can't unwind it. Yeah, and we have no brains left. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think the best answers are exercise, sleep, meditation. These are really the most effective things that one can do. Diet is also effective, I think, but exercise is a must. Exercise boosts your endorphins, reduces inflammation, and blunts your response to stress. It makes you better at responding to stress. So exercise is a big deal. I think actually in that case, yoga or that kind of mind-body techniques Mm. would also be really helpful if it's your thing. For me, it really helps. I, I, I have a hard time sitting still, and I had to sit a lot. So when, I, when I'm able to move, I'd rather do something fast, like running or I actually invested in a small elliptical machine that can keep little next door. So whenever I'm in a meeting that I don't have to have video on for, I'll just be <laughs> on the elliptical or going for walks if you can. Being in nature, actually, being in nature has been shown to have wonderful effects on, on mm. stress levels. My daughter is very outdoorsy. Mm. And so weekends, we try to go for walks and we have a little forest nearby that she likes to go. That is very nice. And another thing is really meditation. And I I do encourage meditation for kids as Mm. well. Like my daughter meditates with me at night. We have these little meditations for children as an app that I really like. She loves and little stories. But that really has changed my life. So as you know, I would just recommend Jack Cornfield. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. it. Yeah. It's fantastic. And meditations for beginners, they're guided meditations. And just his voice is just so soothing and so real. Like he really walks his talk mm-hmm. that I really enjoy that. And then he wrote books and you know, there are other people who, who do this kind of work and it's very, very helpful. And meditation is like exercise. You need to find the kind of meditation that really works for you. Yeah. So for me, it's insight meditation, mindfulness meditation, but there are so many other options. And there are people who like to do that with apps. I personally don't, except for my child, but there are a ton of apps that can really help. It's the same as sleep. You know, sleep kind of got the bad rap in the sense of like, oh, well, that's the thing you can skip. That's the thing you don't have to focus on. Um, talk to me about actually the, the impact of sleep on our brains. Mm-hmm. And sleep is really like one of the last frontiers in a way, because we, we now mm-hmm. understand the importance of sleep for brain health. There are many different things that happen during sleep. One that is very important is that the brain is able to reduce inflammation when we're sleeping. And the other one is that it's really, it's literally the only chance that the brain has to take care of itself. So sleep is me time for the brain. And sleep goes in cycles, right? There are different 
phases of sleep that start with, you know, when you're just falling asleep, there's sleepiness, you start having dreams, but then you go through a phase where you have no dreams, so your body's completely still. And that is the slow wave sleep phase or the deep sleep phase that is followed by REM sleep when we have dreams. But that phase when we're completely still and the brain is not dreaming is actually the crucial component of sleep in terms of health and well-being, because that is really when the brain activates. It's like the brain is your mom and says, okay, the kids are, are down for the night. I can take a shower. I just can take care of myself. And literally the brain is like, oh, everybody's quiet. The house is quiet. I'm going to turn on this new system, the glymphatic system, that is like a dishwasher. It, this literally jets of water, of fluid, that open up in the brain and remove, it's like power wash your brain so that all the toxins, all the impurities, all the waste products, even Alzheimer's plaques are removed then. Wow. Because when we're awake and we're moving, we're doing stuff, there are these, these um, microglial cells in the brain that just pick up all these bits and pieces that need to be getting rid of. And if you're not getting that phase of your sleep, then you're going to miss out on a huge opportunity for the brain to really heal itself. That's amazing. Have you noticed then a correlation between um, a cognitive decline and people getting less and less rest? Yes. Yes, actually, there's a, there's a there's strong evidence that sleep deprivation or even just fragmented sleep when you keep waking up multiple times mm -hmm. at night is associated with the development of Alzheimer's disease in the brain right in, in the 50s. And it's not just Alzheimer's disease, there's also inflammation. There's, there's mm. Basically, I think that when it comes to lifestyle, I think what we're understanding is that if you don't have a healthy lifestyle, you're enabling all your risks to become actual medical issues. In a way, whereas if you have a strong, healthy lifestyle, you're effectively reducing this, this risk and keeping the risks under control almost on a daily basis. So it's a preventative in that respect that you're really avoiding issues and you're keeping your genes at bay in a way. I love that. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a really hard question right now. It may be easy for you though, I don't know. Um, so I live, my health issues, but I have lived a very healthy lifestyle um, with the health issues, I've definitely changed my life. I've changed the way that I eat. I changed my lifestyle, like everything, the way I sleep, everything. But I've chosen to not have children. And I've heard you say in your book, where you break down, so we, you know, going back to the subject we were saying earlier about how pregnancy, like these, the three Ps, right? The, the puberty and the pregnancy. And at the pregnancy, um, whether you've had a baby or whether you've gone through those hormonal changes or not actually has an effect on your future brain and Alzheimer's and things like that. So I literally, as I was reading your book, I was like, I really wanted to know the answer and you can be very honest with me, but was is not having children a possible um, detriment to my brain health as I age? No, our research and other people's research have shown that women who have children have a little bit more protection against Alzheimer's disease as compared to women who don't have children and women have, who have more than five. But it's not universal. What I, what I want to clarify, sure. that, this is observational. This is just of a course. correlation. You know, it's not that you need to have a kid tomorrow. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, is, there are challenges, you know, I haven't, I totally get it that, that you'd rather not. But what is happening then in your brain that that, that, that makes a difference i think it increases plasticity having children so what the research shows is that as women go through pregnancy and especially postpartum that's really when your brain changes the most in your entire life and the fastest mm -hmm. and it changes in ways that are very complicated and we're just starting to really understand but just so far what we know is that your brain shrinks when you're pregnant and perhaps shrinks even more right after the baby is born, but in a way that is very similar to puberty. 
So it's considered an optimization in that I like to talk about pregnancy as, as, a, as a system upgrade, as if the brain is a computer and you had an upgrade during puberty mm-hmm. and now you're having another upgrade during pregnancy because once your baby is born, that's it. You know, if you were the most important person in the room, you can forget about it. Now, <laughs> everything, you basically your job as mother nature intended it is to make sure that human being survives. Right. And that means that a lot of connections in your brain are going to have to be rewired to stimulate your maternal instincts and stimulate your ability to really mm-hmm. respond to the requests of a creature who can't speak or can't move. For a long time. <laughs> and so what people say is that what scientists have shown is that you basically do lose connections in some parts of the brain. Mm. You lose neurons, but your connectivity gets stronger in certain parts of the brain that are preparing you for motherhood. So your brain is going through a rewiring and a remodeling mm-hmm. that seems to be helpful in that plasticity is stimulated. So your brain becomes much more plastic and that seems to give an advantage for the long term as well. Now, if you don't get pregnant, your brain is fine. You know, actually <laughs> you're avoiding this, this turmoil that needs to happen. So I think this is just one factor that is so specifically unique to women. Obviously men can't have children. Mm-hmm. Right? So this is a mechanism, it's a biological mechanism that has evolved to support motherhood. And the vast majority of people see that as being adaptive, even though you have the mommy brain, even though you have brain fog, even though like (laughs) I found myself literally knocking on the door of the fridge before opening the (laughs) fridge. I'm very polite, you know, (laughs) I would just open the door. So it's just knocking and waiting and waiting. And then my husband's like, hmm. (laughs) So that's the thing though, but that's what I process, right? Is that, I'm not going to have a child just so that I can create brain plasticity, but I do look, I do look at this stuff and I actually, I don't think that that's a bad thing. Like if you were like, yes, Lisa, you know, they do have the edge, which you said, right? They do have the edge. So then I go to now, how do I create brain plasticity myself without having a child? Because I just go to, if they're facts, there are facts. And now just being aware of it allows me to think outside the box. So for instance, with someone like, is there something that I can do, like a test or anything that I could do to help me gain um, brain plasticity without actually having to have a child? <laughs> Having, having kids is just one factor. There, there's a million factors. Women who develop or go through puberty early on in life and go through menopause later in life, so those with the longest reproductive span, they also have an edge, right? They, mm. Their brains also have more plasticity because you've had more of these hormones in your body for a longer period of time. So that's, that's another factor. Yeah. Or whether or not you took hormones, throughout your life, whether or not you took like birth control, or whether or not you're going to have to take estradiol for symptoms of menopause. Those also are factors then that are just as important. Uh, your diet is important. Your fitness is important. How much sleep you get per night is important. Your happiness is important. Your positive outlook on life is important. You don't have to have children to protect your brain. It's just one component to brain health. And the reason we were looking into it is it's because we're interested in hormones and how hormones impact the brain. Yeah, like I said, I wouldn't have a baby for that reason. But it's I just I, I'm, I'm such a person that like I want to have the knowledge no matter what that means. So when I heard your you say about um, the benefits of brain plasticity, plasticity when you have kids, the first thing that came to mind was, oh, am I am I now? a step behind and I don't mind if I am it's kind of like I just want to know the truth so that I can then plan for like all right what else can I do um to mitigate this so right I I don't think you you should worry at all these studies are descriptive and I think they're they're important because hopefully they will stimulate more research right right because there's very little research done on pregnancy and the long-term effects of pregnancy on the brain all we know is what happens basically when you're pregnant and like within two oh, years. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Baby, there's very little work done to associate that with anything else later in life. So I think it's just the process of a better understanding of brains 
and how to keep them healthy. And I, I think lifestyle is incredibly important. Mm. We see that at the clinic all the time that when people really comply <laughs> with the guidelines and recommendations that they're given, their memory improves, their attention improves, their overall health really improves. And for some women taking hormones may be helpful. Mm. So there are many different strategies and I think that the approach should be individualized. If you want to learn how to build desire, relieve headaches and get men to do the chores, then click here right now. We all want them to do the chores. Roughly 68% of women have faked an orgasm, but apparently according to new studies, 31% of men